Hello and welcome to another Amash Project Archives series. In this episode, we'll be featuring the Amash 2012 conference that took place in September at the Britannia Hotel in Nottingham, the very first Amash conference. The first speaker is Richard Bennett from the Aetherius Society, based on the work of the late great Dr. George King, who had his first contact in 19. 54 and the Aetherius Society is very much based around the teachings of the Ascended Masters and the ET Higher Contacts. So enjoy this, a retrospective view from 2012. and welcome to the first Amash conference. Thank you very much for giving up your Saturday and coming to hear some excellent, excellent speakers. We're going to start the day with Mark Bennett from the Aetherius Society, but I just want to read you a little bit about his talk. So the synopsis of the presentation, it says, prophecies of doom are made to be broken, and we are living in interesting times, aren't we? Fate is not fixed. Destiny lies in our own hands and we all have deep within us the divine potential to rise above the mainstream and fear, war, suffering and create a new world of peace. Well, I absolutely agree with that. Freedom and, of course, alignment. In 2012, when some have predicted dire catastrophe, many are turning to the ancient writings for answers. And in this lecture, we're going to discover the wisdom given in more recent years by advanced extraterrestrial beings through the contactee Dr. George King, who's the basis and the foundation for the Aetherius Society. So without more ado, I'm going to introduce Mark Bennett. Please give him a warm welcome for our first Amash conference speaker. Thank you and good morning. I'd like to start by leading a very short contemplation where we just think about why we're here, about the nature of change, about our world, and about its future. So could I ask you please to close your eyes for a moment, and breathe deeply and evenly. And this is also a good opportunity to turn mobiles off. Let's make the breath long and deep, without strain and even, even in-breath and out-breath. Let us see on the in-breath a white light on the breath entering our bodies and auras as we breathe in. And as we breathe out, let us see this filling us with light, with peace, with inspiration. And now let's think about the world on a small scale first. Think about our own lives, our houses or wherever we live, how we got here today or yesterday, the hustle and bustle of the city, people, shops, restaurants, think about the news, which uh, is pretty grim most of the time. Think about really what this world is. And let us remember that however different we are from others, we are all part of this world. And we all share responsibility for the state of the world. Now let's imagine what the world could be. 
and should be. A world of wisdom, a world of peace, cooperation, a world that would be ready for interplanetary cooperation, a world that would be ready to greet with open arms wise beings from other worlds. And now let's think about what we can do to change ourselves to make that little bit of difference, which may be a bigger difference than we realise. And probably everyone here is doing something, is doing more probably than the average person, because just by being here today shows an interest in the higher things of life, an interest in what lies beyond the conditioned mindset of the mass of humanity. But I think if we're honest, we will admit that we can all do more. Now let's open the eyes. The title of this talk is The Great Change, Revelations by the Gods from Space. And The Great Change is a significant title in two ways. One, because the change that is coming to our world is going to be colossal. And two, because the nature of this change will not just be great in the sense of uh, very large, but it will also be great in the sense that it will be a very positive thing. There will be difficulties along the way, certainly. There will be challenges, but that is the nature of life. And that is how we learn, and that is how progress is made. Many people talk about the coming changes as if it were all gloom and doom. Whether it is gloom and doom or not depends largely, if not entirely, on us. Because in order to make the great change great, we have to make a great change within ourselves. And it is this great change which is far more important than the fact that the weather is going to change, or whether or not the Earth is going to shift her axis, as many believe. Because it is the change within us which will determine whether or not we can withstand these changes, whether or not we are ready for the new world. The new world being the new age upon this planet. The subtitle of the talk is Revelations by the Gods from Space. And to explain this, I'd like to take us back in time to the 1950s, when obviously England and the world as a whole was a very different place. And when, um, although there was interest in flying saucers, as they were commonly known then, uh, these things were regarded as much more strange than they are now. Uh, particularly in the scientific community, it seems there's been an incredible shift. There's still a long way to go, but there's been an incredible shift uh, from completely discounting the idea of life anywhere in the universe, which is just ridiculous, uh, to scientists talking about, oh yes, well, if statistically, of course, there must be intelligent life out there because the universe is so vast as if they've been saying this all along. Uh, now, this is obviously a good thing. I'm very glad people are talking like this. Um, but let's not forget what's come before. And it was in this climate that a young man, or in his 30s, a uh, young man named George King claimed to have contact from another planet. He was not, in a sense, your average contactee, if there is such a thing, in that he had a very deep interest in mysticism and had for many years. And this uh, interest, though, went further than just being an interest 
because shortly after the Second World War, around the end of the Second World War, he devoted himself to the practice of yoga. Now, many people think that yoga is really just a sort of Eastern form of Pilates or something, but it is obviously, of course, much, much, much more than that. And while yoga does help the body and the mind on a basic level, the purpose of yoga is to induce mystic states so that the practitioner can gain enlightenment. And enlightenment is not something that just happens, in, in my view, and in the view of uh, many others, but not everyone. There are people who promote the idea of enlightenment in a way that is quite positive in many ways. It's good that they're talking about it at all, but it's very limited because it's regarded as just another basic state of being just another mood, if you like. Whereas enlightenment in the traditional yogic sense is something very, very much more. It is a state of whole being. It is a very intense state that takes a lot of work to achieve. And George King practiced yoga with enlightenment in mind for an average of eight to ten hours a day for a decade at the same time as doing a job. He obviously must have cut back quite considerably on sleep at that time, as it would no doubt be possible to do if you were charging yourself up with energy through uh, the yogic practices that he was doing at that time. And he did all this in London. He didn't retreat uh, to the Himalayas and live secluded in a cave, which might seem difficult and, and, and is, is difficult compared to ordinary life. But if you're going to be doing that amount of yoga, very much easier to do it away from people without having to worry about money, without being detuned by the vibrations of others at every turn without everyone around you thinking something different and having other, much lower ambitions in life. And in many ways, this is, this is the test. A really great yogi is someone who is able to raise their consciousness, to detach uh, from humanity, in the sense of detach from the mindset of the masses, and rise above the ordinary world, but without leaving it physically. A very, very difficult thing to do. He had always been uh, intuitive, and apparently during the war, when he worked for the fire service during the Blitz in London, he uh, used his intuitive or psychic abilities uh, to rescue people and was known for it. Through the practice of yoga, these abilities increased exponentially. And this is one thing that happens when uh, one takes to the yogic path uh, in a serious way. The development of powers. And the purpose of these powers is twofold. One, it is to reject them. To bring them about so that they can be risen above. The more power we have in life, the harder it is to control it. And yoga is all about uh, mind control, but not in the negative sense, of course, uh, that, it is, that, that, that that term is often used, but in the positive sense of controlling one's own mind, not being a victim of one's own emotions and passions, but having full control of the latent abilities within us. And the second function of these powers is to use those which are not rejected in service to others. 
Service is a cornerstone of yoga and has become more so as the great change approaches or as, as it has already started. One Saturday morning in May 1954, Dr. King heard a voice that said, you are to become the voice of interplanetary parliament. He wasn't in a meditative state at the time. He wasn't expecting it. He didn't know what it meant. But he did know that it was very, very important. This was the beginning of over 40 years of space contacts on a scale of which I've never seen anywhere else, claimed even. He was in touch with beings from other worlds, either telepathically or by entering a positive trance state and allowing these beings to speak through him. Um, not quite probably every day, but very, very frequently. Mainly trance, uh, it would seem, in the early days, and later on um, the, the telepathic communications became more and more common. And these beings, uh, which is rather unfashionable to say this these days in the uh, uh, UFO movement, these beings are from, or primarily from, other planets in this solar system. And I know that uh, science has supposedly proved that there are no intelligent beings, certainly, say, on Venus or Mars. But the problem is that science just doesn't quite realise the full extent of the wonder of creation. We do not have any benchmark to measure space contacts against because officially, at least, we have no experience of it. So all scientific statements about life on other planets is pure speculation. And I'm glad to say that actually although I think it probably still is unfashionable, it's not quite as unfashionable as it was maybe five or ten years ago to talk about life on other planets in this solar system because of the concept of higher frequencies. Some people call them other dimensions, <coughs> other realms, other planes, higher levels of being. And it is from these realms that these beings originate. So if, uh, well, there's a spacecraft on Mars at present, but let's say we sent hundreds of astronauts to Mars, uh, but let's say this happened. These astronauts would not necessarily find any trace of Martian civilization unless the beings on Mars decided that they should. However, if a yogi, an advanced psychic practitioner, whether it be someone in London or any other city or in the Himalayas, if such a person, uh, through relentless effort, had gained the ability to project in full consciousness from the body, not just drift off in a dream state or uh, some uh, rather dangerous drug-induced in trance, but consciously, unaided, leave the body, fully aware. Such a person could travel in this projected state through space at tremendous velocities. Such a person could, in a projected state, uh, or would be much more likely to be able to um, perceive the high culture, the advanced civilization which exists on and beneath the surface of the planet Mars, and likewise Venus and other planets in this system. These beings have been watching Earth for millions of years. And I won't dwell on this point because I expect it's familiar to, to most people here. But UFO sightings are, of course, certainly not new. We have uh, numerous sightings in the Bible 
and in the Hindu Vedas, uh, to name just two sources, and there are others. Of course, in the Bible, one of the most famous and misunderstood sightings is the Star of Bethlehem. And if we examine this story rationally, we have various options. One is that the whole story is fabricated. Another is that it was some kind of a comet and that the story has been greatly exaggerated because comets can't hover over stables. They may be able to point a direction, but that is not going to pinpoint a stable. And the other option is that the Star of Bethlehem was in fact an extraterrestrial spacecraft which could easily lead people to a specific location and could easily hover over a stable. What is the connection between the birth of Jesus and an extraterrestrial spacecraft? Well, the, an the answer is, is simple and obvious, and that is that Jesus was in fact uh, in the beliefs of the Ethereum Society, a being from another planet. Now, that doesn't mean to say that Jesus uh, was not human in the physical sense, because Jesus was born uh, through the womb of a woman, just like we all are. But the consciousness of the intelligence that we know as Jesus was not of this world. Again, looking at it logically, if you didn't know uh, anything about what religion on this planet and what people generally think and accept, and you said, well, there's a religious leader, or you were told there's this religious leader, and either he was the one and only son of God while at the same time being God. Or he was an advanced being from another planet. Which would sound the more absurd? You talk to most people about Jesus being from another planet and they think you're, 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 you're nutty. But if you look at it rationally, how much more bizarre is it to say that this one person was the one and only son of God and that the only way to get to eternal heaven is through believing in him. It's a very, very strange philosophy. In the Ethereum Society, we actually believe that Jesus came from the planet Venus, again, obviously, the higher spheres of Venus. And Jesus was one of the intelligences who communicated through Dr. King, giving a, a cosmic perspective on spirituality, mainly through a wonderful series of teachings called the Twelve Blessings, which are blessings to spiritual workers and great beings, such as the Earth. And the Earth is, of course, absolutely key to the great change, because the Earth is really what it's all about. I said earlier on that the important thing was the great change within us, well, that's the important thing for us, yes. But the really important thing, important above everything, is the planet herself as an entity. The planet is a living being. And there's been um, some great scientific leaps forward in this regard. Um, scientist James Lovelock and the Gaia hypothesis uh, have introduced this concept to mainstream thought. It's good, but it hasn't quite gone far enough. Certainly a step in the right direction. But when I talk about the, the Earth as an entity, I don't just mean functioning as a biological organism. I mean as a living goddess, a great cosmic being who allows us to live here. A being who is more important in cosmic terms than everyone on Earth combined. We need, if we are, to be victorious through truth into the great change. We need to develop a much greater relationship with the Earth. 
And I don't just mean recycling. Recycling is obviously a good thing to do. Uh, unfortunately, and many people would be very annoyed with me for saying this, but unfortunately, recycling is all too often done for people. Now, it's good to do things for people. It's good to do things for future generations, and certainly we should do this. But an even greater motive for recycling and everything we do to help the environment is to think about the Earth, who bears us despite everything, despite the way we behave, despite ingratitude, despite exploding nuclear weapons on her body, polluting the basic manifestation that she has given us for our sustenance. She just puts up with it. It would be like, um, this is a, an, an, a very clever analogy, I think, um, that uh, Richard Lawrence, who I work closely with, came up, came up with to explain, or just to give us a slightly better appreciation of this situation. Imagine if there were these, oh no, let me reel, reel back a bit. The reason we're on Earth, first of all, is because we destroyed our former planetary home. Uh, this is the planet Maldek, which is now the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter, I believe. This was destroyed through misuse of atomic power. The entire planet was obliterated, and we were left homeless, cosmic vagrants. Because, of course, with the death of the body, the soul carries on. No matter what it has done, no matter what crime we commit, we will always carry on in some form or another, but under great limitation. There is really nothing worse we could have done than to murder a planetary god, murder a planetary being, which is what we did as a race. Of course, it wasn't the whole race didn't get together. We didn't all get together and say, well, let's do this. But a small minority did the dreadful deed. But the rest of us let it happen. We are one race, and we are all responsible for the actions of our race as a whole, which is not a very pleasant thought, but it is one that we need to face. So there we were in our subtle bodies, without a planetary home. And that is when the Earth was approached by other cosmic beings and asked if she would accept us. And she agreed, remarkably. So going back to the, the analogy that helps us to appreciate this, imagine if there was this family of really lazy, nasty people and they lived in a house and they were so unruly that they actually blew their house up and you know it was maybe one or two of them did the actual blowing up but the rest had sort of hadn't really known what was going on hadn't bothered to find out just sat around watching telly and um, doing very little and then this family then uh, knocks on your door and says, I want to live with you. I'm moving in. And they come in, and there's no end, end point to this arrangement. It's not for one night or two nights. It's permanent. And this family offers you no gratitude, no respect, or virtually no gratitude, no respect, messes all your things up, vandalizes the place, and you just allow them to stay because they have nowhere else to go. Now that is a level of spirituality that is quite literally alien, certainly to me anyway. And I'm not suggesting that we should literally do that, but it does give a little idea of, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a silly little analogy really, but it, 
it brings over a point, I think, it helps us to appreciate how much she has done for us, how much she's been through. Because after we came here, our first civilization, uh, known to some as Lemuria, was also destroyed by atomic warfare. And then the next civilization, Atlantis, was again destroyed in a similar way. So it's like these people being in your house blowing rooms up. It's just unbelievable, really. If anything's unbelievable, it isn't that Jesus was from Venus. What's really unbelievable is, is how we have behaved for the past few million years. And on the other end of the scale, the patience of the earth. However, regardless of how patient she is, it is not allowed by cosmic law, natural divine law, for any intelligence to suffer indefinitely. A totally opposite concept to that of um, some orthodox mainstream religions that seem to think that um, a benign God will send people to hell for believing the wrong thing forever and ever and ever and ever. This, this is nonsense. No one is past redemption. There's always hope. There may be difficult times along the way, but there's always hope. People always get another chance. Eventually. Eventually. They'll pay the consequences but then they will get their, their, their second chance. And obviously with the earth, though, we're looking at a completely different scenario because her suffering is not uh, brought about through anything she's done wrong. It's a choice she has made to help others. She's literally sacrificing salvation for us. And this cannot carry on forever, even if she was willing to allow it to happen. So, in short, we have to change or we have to leave Earth. Jesus was, of course, not the only great being to be born onto this planet from another world. Buddha, Confucius, Lao Tzu, Sri Krishna, there are many. And these beings have given teachings in different ways throughout the centuries. Different, slightly different packaging, but essentially the same message. How to change, how to be better people, how to know God, how to know the divine reality within us. And some people have taken notice of this, and some haven't. Uh, all of us here today have not taken enough notice of it. Because if we had, and this is definitely including myself, if we had taken enough notice of it, we would no longer be in the reincarnatory cycle of this planet. We would have progressed to a higher sphere. We would no longer be mortal beings who are born, make mistakes, hopefully learn a little bit, grow old and die. We would have mastered matter. We would have full conscious control over our bodies in every sense. We would have vast powers and vast wisdom and be in a totally different experience cycle. So we have these teachings. And the beings who spoke through Dr. King have not said, you have to join the Ethereum Society and then you'll get... Uh, you know, your, your path to salvation guaranteed. They have said that the Ethereum Society is an extremely important, extremely powerful path to enlightenment and to helping others. But it's not the only way. And there are, there are many teachings, even in corrupted form, such as uh, the Bible, which have some wonderful teachings in. And if people, if everyone who professed to be Christian followed the Bible, the world would be a very, very different place. If everyone followed the Sermon on the Mount, sometimes it almost seems like religious people are going out of their way 
to do the opposite of what their religion teaches. How any Christian can fight in the name of Christianity and kill in the name of Christianity where the teaching is so plain and think they're doing the right thing, not, not fight and think, oh, well, I, you know, this is wrong, but I'm going to do it anyway because I'm just, just sort of not a very good Christian. They actually think this is what it's all about. Historically, hopefully not so much today, if you look at the Crusades in the Middle Ages, for example. So we have been given every opportunity to change, and we are still being given further opportunities to change now. And a, a lot of that stems from the teachings given by these beings through Dr. King. Uh, the message is a very simple one, one of service to others, and yet it is extremely profound. And it certainly does a lot more than just pay lip service to, oh yes, it'd be nice if we were all nicer to one another. As many space messages do have that kind of message, but when you look deeper, you think, well, what does it really amount to? And this is actually one way to test whether or not a message is true or not, whether the source really is what it claims to be. Not just does the message sound nice, because most messages do, in my experience, but does it really have much substance? Would it really have taken an interplanetary mind to tell us those things? So this is one way of testing whether or not a contact is genuine. However, we have these chances, we have these teachings, but time is running out. We don't know how much time there is left, and personally I hope it's the longer the better in some ways, uh, because the longer it is before the great change really gets going in earnest, the more time people will have to prepare to make the right decisions. On the other hand, I'd like to see the great change happen as quickly as possible, even if it means we all have to leave Earth, because at least then the suffering of the Mother Earth will be over at our hand. So there's two ways of looking at it, but the, the sort of the winning argument, as it were, is that she has chosen to bear us. And she, being much better than us, wants us to make it, even if she has to suffer. So I think we need to cooperate with that plan and hope that as many people make it as possible into the new age when we will live here on this planet but in a very different way to the way we live now. In terms of humanity, probably the biggest single event in the great change is going to be what we call in the Ethereum Society the coming of the next master. This is when advanced extraterrestrial intelligence a cosmic master will come to Earth openly for all to see. And this will be the end of the skeptic's argument. There will no longer be any doubt, even in the mind of the most cynical of cynics, that there are extraterrestrial beings visiting Earth. This revelation was made to Dr. King in 1958, on November the 23rd, on a, a small mountain in Cornwall. And like the command, when he was told that he would be the voice of interplanetary parliament, uh, this was not uh, a message given to him or through him in trance. He heard a voice, a physical voice. I believe that he has said that it's, it was almost as if hearing the voice of God. Now, obviously, God, as God, doesn't speak to people uh, in that way, even advanced masters of yoga. But it was that great. And this being is a lord of karma, karma being a divine lord. So it would be fair to say that this being was a god, but not god in the sense of the totality of all things. 
And I'm going to read the message to you now. There will shortly come another among you. He will stand tall among men with a shining countenance. This one will be attired in a single garment of the type now known to you. His shoes will be soft topped, yet not made of the skin of animals. He will approach the earth leaders. They will ask of him his credentials. He will produce these. His magic will be greater than any upon the earth, greater than the combined materialistic might of all the armies. And they who heed not his words shall be removed from the earth. This rock is now holy and will remain so for as long as the world exists. Go ye forth and spread my word throughout the world so that all men of pure heart may prepare for his coming. Strong words, uncompromising words, definite words. There's sort of two ways of viewing this. One is, oh dear, those people who don't make it are going to have to go somewhere else. And the other is, thank heavens, that there will come a time at last when people who want peace, when people who want to cooperate with higher beings, are able to do so without the relentless warmongering and ignorance of the few misleading the many. This is a very positive message. It is a message of hope, obviously for the earth and for us upon the earth. Those people who are not ready for the great change as it unfolds from then onwards will no longer reincarnate upon this planet. This is not a punishment. It's just a natural fact of cosmic life. The vibrations on this earth will rise. The earth will begin to shed some of the limitations which hide her light beneath the bushel of a material form. And it will take adepts of the spiritual sciences to be able to live in that kind of environment. Because spiritual vibrations are, of course, always good, but really, really powerful spiritual vibrations are not good for people who can't take them. If Jesus had come to earth, instead of being born among us, one part of his consciousness in a human body, if he'd come as he is on Venus, everything around would have been burnt by the intensity of the light. We could not have stood it. And there are even cases on Earth of um, people uh, being temporarily blinded by the light of a great master. So imagine what it would be like, a cosmic master of millions of years of evolution. And so when the Earth a greater being even than a cosmic master begins to strip away her limitations and be who she really is. There's a lot of talk about that in the New Age, so-called New Age movement. Be who you really are. Be yourself. Well, one being who has not been able to be herself is the Earth. She has not been able. She has not had the luxury of being herself so that we do have that luxury. So this world will be, the new world will be, a wonderful place where terrestrial people, us, and the Logos, the life force of our earth, will live in harmony. She will still be serving us. She'll still be giving us a home. It's not like her work will be completely over, but she will be doing so in a much more... Uh, can I put it, in a manner that is far less uh, shameful to us. Going back to the, the little analogy of the, the, the people who blow up their house and then move in with you, it'd be more like having a friendly lodger upstairs rather than having these dreadful people trashing the place and eating you out of house and home. So I think there's probably quite a lot of food for thought there, and we have a few minutes, so I'd like to ask if there are any questions.
questions before I finish off? I believe it said that I'm not well up scientifically and perhaps somebody knows better than me, but I believe it said that everything on the planet has that planet's signature which can be measured scientifically and that Homo sapiens is the one thing on planet Earth which doesn't have the Earth's signature and we have the signature of Mars implying that we came from Mars. So I'm a little perplexed as to how you say that we originally came from, was it Bar? Mal Maldek. M Maldek, yes. Well, I'm not, I'm not familiar with that. That's if we did research. come from Maldek and went to Mars, then we will be like we were on the, we are now on this Earth. We I don't, don't have the signature of the planet, no, but we have the signature of the planet of Mars. Well, I think it's certainly interesting that you know, if this research is, is correct, that we don't have the signature of Earth. But I don't, really, I don't really know enough about it, I'm afraid. I don't know what signature means. But I don't believe that we are from Mars or that we lived on Mars before coming here. There are people from Earth who, who have advanced to the Martian experience cycle and those people may have come back to visit us uh, in, in certain ways at certain times. We don't really know. As far as, far as I'm aware, they, they came from Maldek directly to the Earth. Thank you. Uh, how can you be sure that uh, the entities or the intelligences that were in contact with Dr. George King mm -hmm. and other similar representatives of the Theorist Society, how can you be sure that their, um, their nature was not necessarily benevolent or positive and that they're in fact uh, malevolent or de deceptive beings giving uh, a message not necessarily in the interests of humanity? How can you be sure that these intelligences are actually what they are and are not necessarily deceptive in some way? I mean, history of religion and UFO contacts have shown that many of these intelligences are deceptive and have misled uh, their victims, their abductees, etc. And often some of these people go on to create religions and cults. How can we be sure that we're not dealing with something that is not uh, necessarily positive? Okay, yeah. thank you for that question. Um, first of all, uh, I'd like to say that I'm not saying that all extraterrestrial beings are benevolent. There are most certainly hostile extraterrestrial beings uh, in the universe. And um, in the Ethereum Society, we actually believe that we have been, uh, on this planet, we have been protected from um, being taken over en masse by extraterrestrial malevolent civilizations more than once. How do I know that the beings speaking through Dr. King are who they say they are and mean what they say they mean? Well, how do any of us really know anything? We have various faculties for discerning knowledge. One is uh, logic, another is intuition, and another is sense perception. And one has to examine these teachings and make a decision. Well, one doesn't have to examine them, but what, you, know, you have the opportunity to examine these teachings. And then you have to make a decision um, based on those three methods of, of, of obtaining knowledge. And as far as my own experience is concerned, and other members of the Ethereum Society, the message scores on all three counts. And I think by far, though, the most important is intuition. Now, I know uh, people say, you know, oh, it's my intuition that so-and-so is going to happen, and it isn't really. It's, it's, it's an emotion, it's a feeling misread or wishful thinking. But the faculty does nevertheless exist intuitive faculty. And the way to hone this down is through motive. If we, if we want to know the truth so we can use this truth to help others, 
and to serve the divine architect behind all creation, that will be a tremendous step forward in developing our intuition. Another way is through listening to it. And the more we listen to it, the clearer the voice becomes. So you, one can develop intuition, and uh, this is when dealing with matters of this nature, it, it's absolutely essential to apply intuition. Um, there are all sorts of spiritual practices as well, like yoga breathing, uh, which will help to develop this all-important faculty. This is direct knowledge without going through uh, the rather more time-consuming process of logical deduction. However, uh, logical deduction is extremely important as well. And the teachings given through Dr. King add up logically. Now, I don't claim to understand it all. I think there'd be something wrong in a way if I did understand all these teachings because it would show that there obviously isn't you know, a great deal to them. But the essential message is very logical. And whenever I have come across an aspect of the teachings, I think, I, I just don't get that. I don't really like that. And I'm not sure if I really agree with that. It's, I, I've been amazed how as time has gone on, the logical truth of the message, the space message, has become more apparent to me. To the point now where I'm quite willing to trust those teachings that I don't really understand. Sense perception, the third method of obtaining knowledge. When you perform spiritual practices, you will start to feel things. You will start to feel the energy flowing through you. And when doing practices, um, as we will be next week, uh, in cooperation with beings from other worlds, where we're consciously tuning in to their energy, the, the sensations can at times be quite extraordinary. I, I grew up sort of in a very uh, ordinary left brain kind of education. It never I never really imagined that I would ever have uh, any kind of a psychic sensation. I thought that was something that other people had who were born with this ability. But that's another subject, really. So we have to make a decision, uh, well, if we wish to, about these things. You could say, well, we, how do we ever know that our logic isn't faulty and our intuition isn't misleading us and we're not really getting it? But you have to make decisions in life. We all have to make choices in life. And if we sit around and wait for absolute, instant certainty, we're never going to get anywhere because our minds just can't, just don't operate in that way. Even in science, where people talk, you know, science as we know it, where people talk about, oh, well, this is proven. Well, it's only proven insofar as the scientist's theory is rational and insofar as the observations through the eyes of the scientist haven't gone wrong. It all depends on mind. We, we don't yet have the ability to uh, experience high truth uh, directly from spirit without distortion? But it's a good question. Thank you for asking it. So we have time, I think, for just one more question. A quick comment about the Bible. Um, <clears throat> I was struck by what you said about the uh, mainstream religions being uh, very tolerant and uh, spiritually uh, uh, pure. And in that respect, uh, of course, you are quite right. We do, they do present that kind of an image. But also, on the other hand, I thought that if you look at the Bible, it's absolutely chock a block with um, exhortations by God, the divine being, 
to go out and uh, do all kinds yeah, of I think, murder. Yeah, and well, thank, so thank you for that. Now, I'd like to clarify that. Um, the, I should really have said the New Testament, I think. It was the New Testament, when I was talking about the contradiction between, you know, Christians going to war and uh, the, the essential you know, message of, of Christianity. The Sermon on the Mount is um, a very pure, very spiritual text, even if it's been altered a bit. Um, I, I, I'm not I, I, saying that mainstream religions are pure. I think uh, you may have slightly misunderstood me there. I'm saying that there's a lot of good in them and that if we look for it, or if you, if you want to be a really good person and you want to use Christianity as your basis, you can. If you want to be a good person, you want to use Buddhism as your basis, you can. Uh, but yes, certainly, if you were to follow every single word of the whole Bible, you, you, you literally, you, you, would, you would have a few problems. I'd like to end with just uh, one or two minutes of something, something really nice. So could we please raise our hands like this, if you wish to join in with this, and we're just going to send out some light to the world. Okay, fingers together. And let's close the eyes once again and breathe deeply. Visualize light coming into us. And now see, let us see this light flowing down from above the top of the head, through the neck and the shoulders, and out through the palms and through the front of the heart chakra, a few inches in front of the body. Let's see these three streams of white light flowing through us out to the world as a whole. And as we do this, let us not see the world as it is, but let us visualize the world as it could be. A place of peace, healing, enlightenment, and if we believe in any kind of divine creator, let us request from this source, this impersonal, all-powerful source, that its wondrous light flows through us, out into our world, to bring about peace and positive change, so that humanity as a whole can prepare successfully for the great change which is to come. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, everybody. I hope you uh, found that enlightening and enjoyable. I certainly did. Just five minutes so we can do a little tech check and uh, change over. So you have five minutes if you want to go and grab a quick